Hey everybody, welcome to No Ideas Media. I'm Nick Syke and you're gonna watch something pretty freaking cool today. So let me give you just a quick rundown about what it is you're about to see. It was Ag Day in Canada this week, which basically just means a day to celebrate farmers and agriculture and, and get the public thinking about agriculture and food production. Naturally, Rob Syke, my dad, Eager Beaver wants to put on a few events. So, you know, I suggested to him that maybe he would think about bringing Dr. David Zarouk over from Belgium, better known as the Risk Monger. So, Rob and David worked together and concocted this awesome little talk where Rob gives the first half, David gives the second half, kind of a yin and yang view of what the future of agriculture could be. It's awesome. You're about to watch Rob's half right now. Let's get into it. The Mind Mel with Rob Syke and Dr. David Zarouk. What I want to talk about is challenges and opportunities for 2050, and I'm going to give you a fairly optimistic view of what I think could be agriculture in 2050, but before we go there, I want to take you to a picture that I snapped in Lodwar, Kenya. This is one of the poorest areas that I've ever visited. This was a picture I took of a, of a woman uh, clutching the two most important things. She's clutching her child, and she's clutching her technology. And the technology, that phone, uh, with a text, you can find out where there's water or where there might be some food or shelter, and literally it's that poor. Um, but she has a cell phone, that technology. And so when I look at this picture, I get a metaphor for agriculture. Uh, we did a TEDx talk on this stage. If you haven't watched it, it's uh, pretty cool. Um, and, and my question was, you know, would anybody be so cruel to walk up to her and rip the technology out of her hand? That would be just cruel. But there's all kinds of people out there wanting to walk up and rip, rip technology out of farmer's hands, rip technology away from agriculture. So when I get asked the 2050 question, can agriculture feed 10 billion people? That's not the question. The, the real question is, will agriculture be allowed to feed 10 billion people? That's the question that I have, and that's the question that I focus on. My background as a farm kid, growing up in Innisfree, Alberta, was, was rooted in, in cattle and, and, and grains and stuff like that. And since then, um, my background in plant physiology, soil chemistry, crop nutrition has taken me a great many places and a great career path. And most recently, transitioning AgriTrend and AgriData to Trimble, the Trimble Ag software, and um, launching AgVisor Pro, which you'll hear more about in the next little while, but on uh, January 8th, accepting the CEO position with Dot Retail, and we have the CEO of Dot Corporation, Leah Olson Friesen, in the crowd, and that's autonomous robotic farming that we'll talk about. So, um, you know, when, when my Guido and Baba came from Ukraine, if they could imagine that their little grandson would be working in robots on farming, I, I they, quite a stretch, you know, two generations. And I think that's indicative of the pioneering spirit and the technology that we can um, have adopted in agriculture. Uh, another thing that we're involved in is a farming operation in Uganda. We have 5,300 acres uh, west of Gulu towards Congo, and we grow two crops a year, beautiful rainfall, chernozemic soils that have never seen agriculture in the history of civilization. And what we're learning about that is the challenges involved, and you know, one of the things that we can't do, we can't grow corn anymore. We've tried five crops of corn, we can't grow it because we don't have uh, GMO technology, BT corn in Uganda, and after spring, uh, you know, the corn with insecticide two to four times and, and the corn bore knocks your corn down, you just give up on corn. So we're not growing corn even though the country needs corn. So we're growing sorghum and we're growing rice and mung beans and chia and stuff like that. But it gives me some perspective as the challenges we face globally and pretty proud of the work that we're doing there. As I open up my talk, I really want to talk about the big picture. And when, I, when I'm talking about the big picture, I really encourage you to pick up the book Factfulness by Hans Rosling. Uh, Hans is a Swedish, was a Swedish statistician who really founded the company called, or the website called gapminder.org. And if you want statistics on the world, according to UN statistics and WHO statistics, gapminder.org is the place to go. Unfortunately, Hans passed away of prostate cancer, no, of pancreatic cancer last summer, or last spring. But on the way to the hospital to die, he was still finishing this book. This book tells you the way the world is. This book doesn't tell you the way you think the world is. This book tells you the way the world actually is. And the world actually is a hell of a lot better than you think it is. 
and the book was finished by Hans's son and his daughter-in-law, and it is one hell of a good read. It's a statistician's book, but it's a really easy read. One of the slides that, this is Hans, one of the slides that, that really captured this whole event for me was, was the, the fact that we talk a lot about 2050. We lot, talk a lot about feeding 10 billion people by 2050. Well, and, and it's kind of ambiguous and esoteric and out there, but if you remember the Calgary Olympics, that was 30 years ago. It's not that long ago. And, and that's really the time that we have. And, and I put forward a hypothesis that says that the next 30 years are the most crucial years in the history of agriculture on the planet Earth, period. And the reason I say that is you all woke up this morning and not one of you worried about war, not one of you worried about plague, and not one of you worried about famine. Not one of you. And it's the first time in the history of civilization we haven't had those worries. What worries me is we're going to see somewhere between 9.6 and 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. And if we can make it to 2050, we'll make it to 2100 because it'll level off at 11 to 13 billion. But it's the next 30 years that are most critical, and I'll, I'll make a point of this. In the next 30 years, we have to grow 10,000 years worth of food. In the next 30 years, we have to increase global food production 60, 70 percent globally. In the next three years, Canada, in the next 30 years, Canada has to play even a more critical role because Canada is one of five or six regions in the world capable of growing more food than we produce. So for the farmers in the room here, and you know you're in a commodity business and farm prices cycle up and down and you fight biotic and abiotic stress and you fight market forces, but the long-term outlook for your product is pretty damn good. I mean, it's, the demand cycle is still there and Canada is poised well to take advantage of this. We must ensure, and I like using this word, or these words, we must ensure that agriculture is infinitely sustainable. And so when you get into a fight with all of the other food religions out there, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is agriculture infinitely sustainable, yes or no? Because if it's not, then all of us are in peril. We will be tested like we've never been tested before in agriculture in the next 30 years. We can do it, I believe we can, if we work together. I was born in 1960. This was the year, this was the world as it was in 1960. These are the people, when you were born in 1960, that would not see the age of 50 years old. The big red dots are China and India. These are the people that were expected to live over 70. Flash forward to 2018. These are the people that will die under the age of 50. These are the people living above the age of 70. And the red dots, China and India have moved. So for the millennials in the crowd, you're, you're constantly un inundated with, with uh, media that talks about the good old days. Well, here's your choice right now. You want to live here? Or you want to live here? That was not the good old days. We live in the most prosperous, uh, peace, peaceful, secure time ever in the history of mankind, and I put forward that agriculture is a big chunk of that. We live in a time where technology is increased at a global and exponential rate. I grew up in Innisfree, Alberta. It was a time when things were linear. Linear means you walk 30 paces, turn around, and you've gone 30 paces. An exponential world, 30 paces exponentially is 26 times around the planet. This represents internet traffic around the planet Earth. You can see where Hawaii is, that's where Canadian farmers are right now. <laughs> they're, they're beaming back on their smartphones to check on their grain bin sensors. So this is the internet traffic on the world, and a lot of this is, uh, I pick it up from a guy named Peter Diamandis who launched the XPRIZE Foundation, which was the inspiration for the Canola 100 AgriPrize. Uh, Peter is involved with Singularity University, and I just got back from three days in LA with Peter. 
But Peter talks a lot about exponentiality and how 11 years ago nobody had an iPhone and today everybody's got smartphones. We're dumber, but phones are smarter. Anyways, exponentiality, we talk about the amount of data that's being driven every 15 minutes, five exabytes of data. Um, that data is going to proliferate on our farms and in agricultural communities. That data is just going to increase exponentially. And we're going to work on something, we're going to see something happening right now that I'm going to explain to you in a little while called convergence. These technologies do not I exist in isolation. They are converging faster than you can ever imagine. It's one of the reasons you're grappling uh, so hard with change because change is happening so rapidly. But it's not just change in one area. These changes are slamming together. They're converging. One of the real things that I, I, I spend a lot of time on is I think about mindset. And I think this is one of the most important assets you have is your mind. And how do you set your mind up? Do you have a cornucopian mindset? Do you believe the world's getting better? Do you believe that any problem that we're, ha we're handed, we can handle, we'll get through it? Do you believe the world's getting better every year? Or are you a Malthusian? Because there's only two types of brains in here. You're either a Malthusian who believes the world's getting worse and resources are drying up and the world's getting worse every year, or you're a cornucopian and you believe the world's getting better. Unfortunately, most of our kids going to school today are being taught that the world's a Malthusian world. It's being taught uh, a negative world. It's being taught very, very uh, awful things about the world when in fact we are living in the best times we've ever lived in in the history of mankind. I'm a cornucopian. The other problem we're having is uh, urbanites, and I sure wish the front row was all filled with city of red deer cousins, I, because one of the challenges we're having is that it's not 1960 anymore, and people have a romanticized view of agriculture that just simply doesn't exist. You know, there's a need for technology. This is the way it was. And uh, now we have automatic grain carts and stuff, and technology today. My buddy Terry Aberhart, during harvest, came out a couple years ago to Sylvan Lake, right during the middle of harvest, to be at a meeting with us, and there we are after the meeting on Sylvan Lake, drinking beer, watching his wife combine on his iPhone. <laughs> Don't tell me the world's getting worse. <laughs> that there's a good thing. And Lachelle's a better combine operator than Terry, by a long shot. And you get inside of Terry's brain. I took this picture. He got his head shaved one time. I took a picture of his brain. And, I, I, and, and Terry produced this next. So he's a 15,000 acre farmer, young man. And, I, you know, this is the, the brain of a farmer, and it's a great mindset. You know, you're dealing with all sorts of stuff as a farmer, and it bothers me when I hear farmers say, well, I'm just a farmer. You are dealing in the most complex business that I know of anywhere. I mean, again, the stresses, the, the outside forces, and the complexity that you deal with every day in your brain, and it leads to lots of data. Uh, data around soil testing data, modus data, sensory data, weather station data, farm record data, data from your equipment, guidance data, commodity prices and inventory data, CRM and human, tra uh, human uh, tracking of your people and, and uh, managing your people and, and uh, satellite imagery and historic data and prescription data and file management and zone generation and machine and it's big data and it's going on every day inside of a head of a farmer. And it's confusing, and there's more of it, and it's happening faster, and, well, how did we get here? Well, we, we got here because all of this stuff. So I wrote this book in 2013-14, and this was talking about 10 drivers that will shape agriculture in the next decade. And I, and I worked on these 10 different areas because as individual silos. But that's not the case anymore. It, it's coming together. This led to conversations with Bill Gates that I had May 2nd of a couple years ago where we got six hours to spend with Bill talking about how we're going to utilize technology that's going on your farms in Canada here, how we're going to use that to lift the smallest uh, uh, farmers up to a higher level of prosperity. I, I found it interesting and stimulating conversation. And I, I believe that we're moving to the fifth iteration of agriculture. The first iteration, muscle, then machine, then chemistry, then biotech, then convergence. The era of muscle. This was not a fun time. This is the era of our great-grandparents or our grandparents. This is 
man and oxen and horse, and it was brutally hard. And here's a guy using horses to plow up his land. And then we migrated to the second iteration, Agriculture 2.0, which we're still in, is the machinery age. And you're going to see a commonality here. You see a picture of a guy plowing, and now you see a picture of a, of a tractor pulling one-way discers. And it, it, when you go to Kenya, and you see them using one-way discers on a, on a three-point hitch, working the crap out of the soil in Kenya to prepare these small plots of land, I'm going, my God. There's got to be a better way than them using that kind of force on the soil and destroying the structure and organic matter. We Surely we, we could learn and do things better, and we have. The third iteration of agriculture is the era of chemistry, and I would say it goes back really to the early 1900s with the invention of the Haber-Bosch process. Haber-Bosch takes the 78% inert nitrogen that I just breathed in and turns it into ammonia that can be turned into urea and other fertilizers. I would argue that the Haber-Bosch process is the most important invention in the history of man because 50% of every human being on the planet owes itself to fertilizer. This is also the era of chemistry where we had 2,4-D come along, we had uh, atrazine, we had uh, Triolate or Avidex and Treflan and Trifluralin and Ethylfluralin and we worked the land and back in those days when I started my career we measured the chemistry by pounds on ground of active ingredient in pounds per acre and today our chemistry is so advanced it's in grams per acre it's absolutely targeted absolutely specific it's amazing what we've been able to do but in 1996 something really amazing happened in 1996, we had the first genetically engineered crops hit the marketplace. They were herbicide tolerant crops. So instead of working the shit out of your land or instead of spraying with five or six different herbicides, we we're able to plant a herbicide tolerant crop and take a, a pop can of Roundup and spread that over a football field and control the weeds. And that's been absolutely amazing. This picture here is a wonderful picture. This picture is a picture of a farmer seeding his crop between the stubble of last year's crop. That stubble would have trapped moisture. There's no tillage in this picture. The rows are absolutely straight. There's no weeds. This is a wonderful picture. This is a picture, it's marvelous. The era of biotechnology is not the era of more chemistry. The era of biotechnology is the era of less chemistry. BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, put inside of corn, soybeans, and cotton, and now brinjal, and now cowpeas, has reduced the insecticide load that farmers have to put on their land to control insects. It's a wonderful technology. It's an amazing technology, and it's a technology that has moved us in a trajectory much faster and higher than the Europeans, because they don't have it. So when we talk about the fifth iteration of agriculture, which is called convergence, which is the convergence of all this technology and you look at our trajectory and you match that up against the European trajectory, the Europeans can't be as good because they don't have the fourth iteration. They don't have biotechnology. So their agriculture is 4.0 and I postulate that our agriculture is 5.0. And 5.0, the convergence of biosynthesis, robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, precision ag, all of that stuff is coming together faster than we could ever imagine. This is, uh, this is Intellicon. This is the creation of a, a Wi-Fi mesh over your farm. Uh, Lori and I have a small acreage by Olds and we've got Intellicon and it produces a Wi-Fi mesh over the farm. So if I want to hook a weather station or a soil moisture probe or whatever to it, I don't need to use SIM cards. I just hook it up to the IP address and away we go. Uh, farms today, I believe, in the next uh, two to four years, I, I look for ubiquitous connectivity across agricultural landscape. Uh, that's important. Autonomous. Um, robots on farms. Today, the number one issue for a great many farming operations is labor. They cannot find enough labor. That's why the equipment is so big, because if you find a good operator, you're going to trap that person in the glass cage there. You're going to trap them in 160 feet of sprayer rather than 60. It just makes simple math. But autonomous robotics has a way of changing. It does two things. Number one, it addresses the labor issue that a lot of farmers are facing. 
And the second thing, it creates excitement so young people can come back into agriculture. And just, this is DOT. This is made by uh, Norbert Bougeau. This was invented in Saskatchewan. Uh, it's a 175 horsepower Cummins engine, tier four, with four hydrostatically driven tires. It's pulling into its first implement here. It's docking like a Soyuz docking into a space station. And now it's seating. There's no, there's no cab, there's no hitch pin. It's just 100% autonomous and it's seeding the crop. And once you're done with that, you can hook it into another piece of equipment like a grain cart and it can do follow me and pull off grain off a combine. Or you can hook it into a sprayer. We're testing this in Maricopa right now. It's 120 foot with the 1600 gallon stainless steel boom. And this thing will run 100% autonomously. These are exciting times. Now you hook that together with the agronomy that we've learned over the years, tie that agronomy with variable rate technology so we can vary the amount of seed and fertilizer, crop protection products and irrigation so we can VRE or variable rate everything in real time. You tie those prescriptions from an agronomist like Dale Federick here, you take that brain and you put it into shape files and you shove it into DOT and all of a sudden all of that agronomy brain power is, is moving everything in terms of a variable rate kind of way. And, and there's different ways that we're going to attack this problem, like from the ground up with soil sensors or soil measurements such as electrical conductivity, or from the sky down with remote sensing from satellites or aerial or drones or a variety of different ways. And if we have access to the data from the sky, like high prospectral data, and on the way back from Edmonton, I was just talking to MDA, McDermott, uh, uh, Det uh, McDermott Detweiler and Associates, and they, they want to work with uh, providing hypospectral data to farmers. We literally could diagnose club root on your canola. I'm pretty sure we could do this with regression analysis from, from the sky, which would be kind of cool. Uh, stream technologies, Miranda Rado Carr is in the room here. Her and I are working on a project right now to use streams spectroscopy technology. We're, we're collaborating with Ryer Malting out of Alex and we're using light or spectroscopy to test protein levels in, in, uh, in barley. And if we can do that, then we could do protein levels in wheat. We might be able to do folly numbers or ash or whatever we're checking for. We can check for attributes in real time using spectroscopy. And agriculture is changing globally. This is a picture of a Panasonic factory in Singapore. What do you think it is? Well, it's an indoor farm and they're growing huge amounts of produce, high water containing produce, close to the point of consumption. 3D printing, whether it's parts on the farm or engines or um, it, whether it's uh, 3D uh, plastic parts or food. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was eating a 3D printed pizza, 3D printed cookies, and you have to ask yourself, what's the ink that's going to go into a 3D printer cartridge? Well, you have to give pretty high marks to corn, soybeans, and canola, and stuff like that. So broad acre crops will still be playing a, a tremendous role, but the substrates will be used in ways that we can't even imagine. And we're going to try to shrink time and space by far, at providing farmers with answers to their questions, answers now. And one of the things will come into your farming operation in not too distant future is augmented reality where devices will give you a whole bunch of more readings and information tied to data systems and increase your ability to see what's going on in the field. Or right now it's 37 hours from Olds to Uganda travel time. And so maybe a better way to do this would be to simply beam myself into a robot in Uganda and scout the crop through a haptic suit embedded into an autonomous or into an avatar robot in Uganda. And that's going to happen a lot faster than you guys think. And then the ability to manage farm data, this is the program that we sold to Trimble, but this is literally managing your entire farming operation on, on your, in your smartphone, everything. Right from seeding all the way through your soil test data, all the way through to your grain carts and, and monitoring your bins, everything on your, in your hand. And this is going to open up tremendous opportunities for young people in agriculture because we're going to need systems integrators. Right now, farmers are lagging behind the technology because we don't have enough young people to make it work. And we need you guys to graduate and be skilled so you can help us make all this stuff work. And it'll lead to increased sustainability. And that's important to all of us. Soil health, water use efficiency, greenhouse gases. And I don't care what religion you belong to, whether you're a vegan, 
or a meditarian or vegetarian or conventional or regenerative or whatever you are. We, we all agree that agriculture must be infinitely sustainable. And so what brings Dr. Zarouk to Canada is the work that we've been doing in the area of non-science. And I believe non-science or nonsense is the biggest threat to global food security today. Is it a question of knowing science, uh, knowledge-wise, or just no science? Is it no, understand, or no? Is it no GMOs, just none, or to understand the science of GMOs? Is, is this really, I think, the accurate acronym for GMOs, generally misunderstood organisms? Because people just simply don't know what it is. It's a first world food paranoia problem. People protesting against something for which they have no understanding. The more vehemently, vehemently you're opposed against GMO, the more I question your deep understanding of the science, because if you understand the science of genetic engineering, you absolutely could not be against it. You couldn't be. Are these people protesting, what, hard cheese, because 90% of the hard cheese in North America is GMO'd? Are they pro protesting diabetics, because Novolog and Humalog uh, and Novolin are uh, GMO, genetically engineered insulins? Are they protesting hemophiliacs that are kept alive? No, nope. they're just mad, just mad and scared. And I understand being scared, it's fair enough, fair enough. But if you can't define what it is, really should you be against it or should you try to understand it? Survey, Jason Lust, 1,000 Americans, 82% say if it's GMO should be labeled. Same survey, 80% of Americans say if it has DNA in it, should be labeled. <laughs> Riddle me that. Virtually all the food we eat has been modified, and genetic engineering is an advancement on the breeding process. We start off with open pollination, hybridization, polyploid, mutagenesis, cross species. All of that's been going on for a long time. Now you add in genetic engineering, which is more precise, does it quicker. People freak out, and then CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR-Cas13 is coming. It's going to change everything. When I grew up as a kid, um, when I grew up as a kid, uh, grapefruits weren't red. They were white fleshed. Now all the grapefruits are red fleshed. Do you ever ask yourself the question, how did they make the grapefruits red? This is how they did it. They exposed the seeds to gamma ray nuclear radiation. They scrambled the chromosomes through a process called mutagenesis. They scrambled the chromosomal complex with nuclear radiation. That's okay. You can grow that organically, no problem. That's okay. Flick three genes off in an apple to prevent it from growing brown, and Satan's coming. <laughs> this, is, this is a lack of understanding. So this paradoxically could be a label. Chemo, nuclear, mutated, organic, non-GMO. <laughs> and there's a proliferation of absence labeling on, based on fear, uncertainty, or doubt, or FUD. Non-GMO turkey liquor. It's a carcinogen called liquor, but I guess if I'm going to get hammered, I want to get non-GMO hammered. <laughs> non-GMO project. This is deception at its finest. Slapping this label on tomatoes and cucumbers and spinach and rice and all kinds of different stuff for which there is no genetically engineered product. All it does is create fear. And paradoxically, the monarch butterfly was genetically engineered by Mother Nature herself. It's like this. The labels are meaningless, right? So in the next 30 years, we must grow 10,000 years worth of food. We've got to increase production. We've got to make sure agriculture is infinitely sustainable. We've got to do it like we've never done it before. Can we feed 10 billion people? I think we can if we can leverage the tools and work together and if the tools aren't ripped away from us. Well, this is why we invited Dr. David Zarouk. He's uh, Canadian born raised in the Catherine, St. Catharines area of Ontario, but David is, uh, is uh, now in Belgium, and he's a philosopher who spent a lot of time in science, and so he does a lot of writing of science. But I, I sent him into the future, so David was in the year uh, 2050, and uh, he's just coming back right now. David, David, are you back? I David, think so. are you back from 2050? I, so, yeah. I, I think I am, yeah. It's, um, it's strange here. It's. What's been happening here? I, I, I came back and 
every everything's different. I was, well, you're you're back to where it was in nine, in 2019, David. That's what, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, that, yeah. So that's, hey, David, what's farming like in the year 2050? We're going to have to leave it there, right? As it's getting interesting, I know, I know. But you can tune in next week for David's half of this talk. And it's killer. Like, the risk monger, he knows what he's talking about. He's got this EU perspective on agriculture that's just dynamite. It's not something we often get in Alberta. So, again, tune in next week for sure. You're going to love what you see. And if you love what you see on this channel in general, don't forget to like and subscribe. Consider supporting us on Patreon as well. A little dollars goes a long ways. And thank you for watching.